Gentile. Bad translations of the word Gentile and why it matters. Or purifying speech and uncovering witchcraft. This presentation is why the word Gentile should basically not be used. And why. Here's an example. In the Hebrew, we come across the word called akum or goy, and that's usually translated as Gentile. And then there are other words for non-Jews that are translated as Gentile as well. However, the laws, the Hebrew um, that's in question is about various laws pertaining to different types of non-Jews. And one, one thing that we come across is actually very negative towards a certain type of non-Jew. And we're going to be doing a lot of juxtapositions and show you why Gentiles should not be used. So here's an example. In the Hebrew, it will say an akum or goy, but instead we're going to translate it as Gentile here. So a Gentile who studies the Torah is obligated to die. They should only be involved in the study of their seven mitzvot the seven laws of the children of Noah. Similarly, a Gentile who rests even on a weekday, observing that day as a Shabbat, is obligated to die. That's from the Rambam and the Mishnah Torah, Hilchot Malachim 10.9. Um, the Rambam's Mishnah Torah is uh, basically a codification of all Jewish law, and it's a highly important text, and it's one that um, most Jews get Jewish law from. So this carries a lot of weight. Hilchot Malachim means the laws of kings. And this is primarily the text where uh, there are a lot of non-Jewish laws. So we're going to quote from Zephaniah, the prophet Zephaniah here. And this is kind of the muse, basically, of my entire presentation. And that is getting back to a pure speech. And Zephaniah says, For then will I turn to the people a pure speech, that they may all call upon Hashem to serve him with one consent. Zephaniah 3 9. So, in the future, Hashem, during the times of Mashiach, during the reign of Hashem here on earth, Hashem is going to give people a pure speech. Um, and that alludes to the fact that right now we don't. And so I'm helping to purify that speech. Uh, in anticipation for those times. So why is pure speech important? Speech is actually everything. Speech is everything. It's how Hashem created the world with his speech. He had the ten utterances that he uh, spoke in Bereshit, the uh, book of Genesis, and <clears throat> through what's called the Seder Histal Shalus, the order of the chain of events for creation, he continually creates things and places those things into being. Even at this very moment, he's constantly creating. And if he were to stop speaking, he, creation as we know it, uh, f the physicality that we know it would cease to exist. There's a Hebrew word, safa which means speech, language, lip, or boundary. <clears throat> and this could be shown and demonstrated in the book of Genesis, Bereshis. And the whole wor world, and the whole earth was of one safa, and of one speech. And Hashem said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one safa. And this they began to begin, and this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their safa, that they may not understand one another's safa. So Hashem scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because Hashem did there confound the safa of all the earth, and from thence did Hashem scatter them abroad upon the face of the earth. So that's recounting the tower, the the story of the Tower of Babel, the, of Babel, and how Hashem scattered them and and gave them um, uh, mix up their speech. 
And then we ha- when we've already seen the verse from Sophonia, for then will I turn to the people a pure, pure Safa, that, <coughs> excuse me, that they may call all call upon Hashem to serve him with one consent. So we will go from the times where people's speech are not pure and not in one accord. And now you have Sophonia saying that one day there will be a pure Safa, a pure speech, pure language, a pure lip or pure boundary. This verse is not just about speech, but rather the boundaries of speech. The lips, so when a person talks, the, the air goes from their lungs, goes out from their lungs, uh, over their tongue, through their mouth, over their tongue, uh, and through and over their teeth. And then the very last thing that forms their, their language is their lips. So the lips are actually the last boundary of speech. It's, it is the boundary of speech. When people agree on a common boundary, they can then be at peace. And it's the same thing with speech. If, if there are problems with speech, um, then you're not going to understand one another and you're going to have a problem actually creating peace. If you create peace, it will be more of a chance rather than an actual explicit thing that you can set out and do. So a lot of times people today have problems just with pure semantics. They don't understand, even though they're using the same language. Maybe people are saying English. They don't understand one another and one another's semantics or definitions of the actual words that they're using. And this is, a, this is one of the problems. And the definition, the semantic that I have a problem with is, is the word Gentile. So let's get into exactly what is a Gentile. Gentile is from the Latin word gentilis, and it's somebody who's uh, belonging to the same family, uh, someone who bears the same name as their master. In the context that it's usually used today, though, it's it's usually one of the poetic nature, which means foreign, exotic, or belonging to the same people or nation. And the Romans actually used this term to denote non-Romans. So let's let's actually start focusing on something here. <clears throat> In the Rambam Mishnah Torah Hilchot Malachim ten nine, let's let's focus on the Tauger translation. And we already went through this. A Gentile who studies the Torah is obligated to die. They should only be involved in the study of their seven mitzvot, the seven laws of the children of Noah. Similarly, a Gentile who rests, even on a weekday, observing that day as a Shabbat, is obligated to die. Now, a lot of times, uh, upon reading this, you would not think this is you. Um, Yet, you have many people telling you this is you because it says Gentile. So, what, what is it? And we're going to get to that. Here's some more problem texts, just so you can tune in and listen to, just listen to yourself think when when you uh, come across these kinds of verses, and um, pay attention to how you're feeling and how you're thinking about what what it is that these things are saying, and then use those gut feelings that you have to. Um, focus on what we'll be talking about in when it comes to discerning whether this is you or not. And we so let's let's focus on um, what the Rambam says here, and that is we may not draw upon a covenant with Gentiles, which will establish peace between them and us, and yet allow them to worship idols, as Devarim De- Deuteronomy seven two states, do not establish a covenant with them. <clears throat> Rather, they must renounce their idol worship or be slain. So right here, we actually have a hint that the Gentiles here um, are not all non-Jews, but rather they are Gentiles that uh, are in idol worship. They are idol worshipers. So there's a hint, but it's not yet clearly defined. <coughs> Excuse me. It is forbidden to ha- It is forbidden to have mercy upon them, as the Varim states there, do not be gracious to them. Accordingly, if we see a Gentile being swept away or drowning in the river, we should not help him. If we see that his life is in danger, we should not save him. It is, however, forbidden to cause one of them to sink or push him into a pit or the like. 
since he is not waging war against us. To whom does the above apply? To Gentiles. So this doesn't really tell us a whole lot about Gentiles, except that um, Gentiles are viewed as pretty much negative. There's a negative uh, view towards them. You're not supposed to help them in any way, but at the same time, you're not supposed to hinder them in any way. You just basically let them let them be, even if they are, even if they do need help. And as a previous paragraph shown, they are. It's hinted that they're considered idolaters. <clears throat> Yet you would think here that because the, the Tauger translation uses the term Gentile, it would mean all non-Jews. And there's another term here that's used in the Hebrew. You don't see it in the Hebrew because I haven't posted the Hebrew, but there's an Iker term. An Iker term means a function. Um, it's, it's an actual common term that is used that carries certain context, connotations, and laws associated with the term. And that Iker term is called lo ma'alen velo maridin. It literally means you don't you don't uplift and you don't push down. Uh, basically, in regards to a pit. In other words, if you see a, this gentile, this goy, you're not supposed to help him up and you're not supposed to push him down. You just leave him be, even if he is dying. That's exactly what this this law is stating st- stating here in Hilchot of Odazara. So you have to ask yourself: Is this you? You would think so, since it. It says Gentile, and most people say that you are a Gentile. If you talk to a rabbi, he's going to tell you you are a Gentile. But is this correct? So, in order to answer our answer that question, let's focus in on this verse. So, let's focus in on this uh, Rambam's Mishnah Torah here in in Hilchot Malachim, chapter ten, verse nine. So, let's focus on a work. Actually, um, the work is called the Divine Code. It's written in English. It's a translation of a Hebrew book called Sheva Sefer Sheva Mitzvot B'nai Noah. Uh, excuse me, Sefer Sheva Mitzvot Hashem, the Seven Commandments of Hashem, the book on the Seven Commandments of Hashem. However, we're going to not focus on that Hebrew work right now. We're going to focus on the translation that was. Um, translated uh, partially by uh, Shulman with the help of Tauger actually and they didn't they didn't actually do a complete one-to-one translation they left some things out and let's so let's focus on this English text <coughs> that actually talks about this Hilchot Malachim 10 9 <coughs> and that, that says and there are two places major places in the divine code that says that the Torah as a whole is an inheritance from God for the Jews, from God for the Jews alone. And a Gentile, so we have the word Gentile, who delves into areas of Torah that are unrelated to the Noahide code is, is liable for punishment by the hand of heaven, as explained earlier in topic 3.2. So this is from chapter 5, apparently. Uh, in contrast, it was also explained in topic four too. Okay, so the focus here, though, is the fact that the one we have the Torah as a whole is an, as, is an inheritance from God for the Jews alone. Um, that actually is not true. The Ramban, the commentary of the Ramban on on um, Devarim, says that uh, there are certain types of non-Jews called Gertoshav. Uh, and, and in particular, though, however, there's a certain type of non-Jew called a ger. The Hebrew word is ger. That attaches to Hashem. If he attaches, he or she attaches to Hashem, his inheritance is the Torah as well. And he is part of Kehilat Yaakov, the congregation of Jacob. And his inheritance is Torah as well. So that's actually not, not true. Uh, that first, that, this first bit right here. Uh, the second thing that we're going to focus on, however, is the Gentile who delves in areas of Torah that are unrelated to the Noahide Code. Now, a Noahide Code, he's probably assuming, or he's probably um, meaning the laws of the children of Noah here. And there's another part that we will focus on in the book, and this is from uh, 
the 3 2 here. So this is chapter 5, and this is 3 2. And this is just a re repetition. A Gentile who delves deeply into other areas of Torah is liable and should only be deeply involved in the study of the Noahide Code in which he was commanded. Also, if a Gentile abstains from weekday activities and makes a Shabbat a Sabbath for himself, even on a weekday, he is liable. And then it will go on to say that this is obviously includes one who establishes a holiday for himself <clears throat> or a festival. That was the English. Now let's actually look what the Hebrew says. So the divine code is, is partially translated, mostly translated, even though uh, critical things are left out. But it's translated from a book by Rabbi Moshe Weiner called Sefer Sheva Mitzvah Hashem. The book on the seven, the the book on the seven mitzv seven commandments of Hashem. Now in the book it says, a Ben Noach that involves himself in Torah is obligated to die, and he should. And this, the, the you want to focus on this noun right here. It says a Ben Noach here, so. <clears throat> now that we got in, involved in the actual Hebrew, now we can actually look up and try and find what a Ben Noach is by definition. So a Ben Noach that involves in Torah is obligated to die, and he should not involve himself except except in the Sheva mitzvahs only, and, and only his seven mitzvahs, which are the <clears throat> Sheva mitzvot Ben Noach, the seven laws of the children of Noah. And... And then it goes on to say, and if a Ben Noach rests even on a weekday, and, he, uh, and if he rests uh, and he keeps it like a sh Sabbath, he's liable to die. So what this is saying here is that a Ben Noach shouldn't even be resting. He, couldn't even, he can't even be resting on the weekday, and he definitely can't be keeping it as a Shabbat, as like a religious day, because he'll be liable for death. And he can't create any holidays for himself. And that's from the Sheva Mitzvah Hashem, which is the Divine Code's original Hebrew version, page 37. So then let's look in... So the fact that these are creating, <clears throat> or coming from... Uh, these laws are coming from Hilhot Malachim 10.9. Let's actually look for an English translation to Hilhot Malachim 10.9 and see what that says as well. And then we can juxtapose what it said in the laws of uh, Hilhot Malachim from an actual English translation, and then what is actually said in the Divine Code. A Gentile, and this is from the Divine Code here, a Gentile who delves deeply into the areas of Torah is liable and should only be deeply involved in the study of the Noahide Code in which he was commanded. Also, if a Gentile abstains from a weekday from weekday activities and makes a Shabbat for himself, even on a weekday, he is liable. This obviously includes one who establishes, and it's going to say a, f a festival day. <clears throat> now let's look at the English tra an English translation. This is from the Tauger translation. The uh, Tauger translation is found at uh, like Chabad.org, for instance. It's a popular translation. A Gentile who studies the Torah is obligated to die. They should be involved only in the study of their Sheva Mitzvot. So here we have is liable. Liable for what? Well, it's it's clarified more so in the English, and I know this uh, from reading the Hebrew as well, that it's actually liable for death. Um, Divine Code doesn't mention that. And then the Divine Code, you should only be deeply involved in the study of the Noahide Code. Well, it says here that, that um, should only be involved in the seven mitzvahs. So the divine code seems to correlate the Noahide code and the seven mitzvahs as one as one in the same. Similarly, a Gentile who rests even on a weekday, observing that day as a Shabbat, is obligated to die. Needless to say, he is obligated for that pub punishment if he creates a festival for himself. So you can see here how the divine code kind of changes things up. It's not a, a direct copy and paste they change the fact that it's liable for what liable for death here <clears throat> and also there's a change in the noun here for uh, the Sheva Mitzvah's B'nai Noach the seven laws of the children of Noah and they change that to Noahide code <clears throat>
as I mentioned basically in this in this slide. So there's not a whole lot to be gained from the English translations. We're, we're going to have to dig deeper and we're actually uh, have to get to the original Hebrew text. So let's focus instead on the original Hebrew. And then from there, we're going to actually juxtapose the terms. So the critical verse to study, let's, let's narrow it down a little bit more. There are two different subjects, yet both are translated as Gentile. So, <coughs> excuse me, let's focus in on that first sentence of that English uh, sentence, which is uh, a Gentile who involves himself in Torah is liable for death. So let's just focus just on that little sentence right there. And so in the Hebrew, we have the European version of the Mishnah Torah. The Rambam's Mishnah Torah, which is a uh, very prestigious, uh, it's the magnum opus of the Rambam and just about every single Jew today holds the Mishnah Torah to a very high degree. It's referenced highly, it's used all the time. The European version is also known to be censored. And so in the Hebrew here, it says that the Akum, and the, this double tick right here, signifies <coughs> um, signifies that it's an acronym and the acronym stands for the worshipers of stars and constellations avoda kochavim umazalot avoda kochavim umazalot it's an acronym and it basically can be translated as idol worshiper it's a it's a worshiper of the stars and constellations not hashem and so the akum she'asek betorah is hive mita. The the idol worshiper that involves in himself in Torah is worthy of death. And then now let's see. And so we so it is is well understood in Judaism that the akum means idol worshiper here. It is what the censors put in to denote idol worship. And then so let's see what is. Uh, written in the Sheva Mitzvos Hashem book by Moshe Weiner that the Divine Code is written from. This is a Ben Noach. So if you see here, these two nouns are actually different. The subjects are different here. You have the Akum, idol worshiper, and then you have a Ben Noach. A Ben Noach that involves himself in Torah is Haiv Mita, is worthy of death. Now, we haven't gotten, got into the definitions properly yet, but the Akum, let's say that the Akum is the idol worshiper, and the Ben Noach is actually someone who is not an idol worshiper. A Ben Noach is rather somebody who keeps the, she, the Sheva Mitzvahs Ben Noach, and one of those seven is to refrain from idolatry. So we know by definition that this Ben Noach and this Akum are different. Yet, if they're different, then why in the world were these things changed? It's a, it's a question. It's not, the question isn't actually the focus of what we're talking about. The focus is that they are different and that this is a problem. Uh, but, that, but that is a secondary question that needs to be asked is why is, why is these changed? And it's because the, um, it seems to be at least that, and it's stated in videos by Rabbi Weiner, that he believes that the Akum and the Ben Noach are synonymous. Um, however, if you know what the Akum is and you know what the Ben Noach is, they cannot be synonymous because one is an idolater and one is not. So let's see what's going on here. <coughs> Why does this all matter? Um, they are different sentences. So these two sentences in Hebrew are actually different, yet they're being translated as the same into English, which is the Gentile that studies, that involves himself in Torah is liable for death. And this is a problem. Uh, they, yet they clearly have different subjects in the Hebrew, and the original Hebrew, as I just shown, doesn't matter. Yes, it does matter, because a Ben Noach, and as I'll show, a Ben Noach keeps the seven. Um... Outwardly, he keeps the seven. He doesn't. He doesn't uh, commit idolatry, and we know this. I'll, I'll go into what the Ritva says. The Ritva is a rabbi. There's. A, it's another acronym for a rabbi. Uh, rabbi Ashvili, and then uh, he wrote on Makos nine a the three different gedarim, three different definitions of non-Jews, 
And then even the Rombaum himself in, that's actually, I shouldn't say Hilchot, oh yeah, no it is, in Hilchot Malachim 811, in Hilchot uh, Malachim 811, the Rambam defines uh, what a Ben Noach is, and that is somebody who <clears throat> keeps the seven, even if he's not doing it because the Torah says so, he just feels like they're the right thing to do, and that's basically the common definition of uh, Ben Noach. <coughs> The Akum, the Akum, it's an acronym used by the European printing press censors, either the Jewish censors or the Christian censors. In the time of uh, medieval Europe, uh, the a lot of hatred for, for Jews came about through these texts, and they didn't want the texts to think that they were be t being talked about, by, for, uh, about all non-Jews. So what they did was they censored the texts and they made it explicitly the Akum. And that acronym stands for Avoda Kochavim Umazalot, the servants of stars and constellations. So you're probably wondering about the European censors. Um, a common, a common, uh, a common counterpoint, if you bring this up to, say, a rabbi, for instance, is that uh, who knows what it says then? You know, uh, they'll say uh, it actually is censored and it doesn't mean that, it means all non Jews. However, if you don't know what the uncensored texts say, then why are you even using it? Why quote it if, if, you, if you don't know? So, uh, saying that you don't know what that verse means <clears throat> and uh, then just kind of by happenstance going along and saying it's non Jews is not, is not, uh, it's not good scholarship, and it's really uh, it's really a bad way of giving over the Torah. You have to know the subject of what it is that you're talking about, particularly in the fact that we're talking about things that are worthy of death here. If it says that it's, it's something's high mitah is worthy of death, uh, this is a big deal, and it should be taken very very seriously. And so, a common but wrong fix that a lot of people take is that they translate um, any kind of non-Jew that they come across as Gentile, and they just put it on, under one huge um, category called Gentile. This is a problem. The reason why is because there's laws that pertain to idol worshippers, and there's laws that pertain to non-Jew, or there, there's excuse me, there's laws that pertain pertain to non-Jewish idolaters, and there's laws that pertain to non-Jewish non-idolaters. And there are two different halachot. For instance, um, a non-Jew uh, who is not an idolater, you do have an obligation to save his life. And so one, one way to, to look at this is through juxtaposition. So the subject's in the very next verse. So I showed you Hilchot Malachim 10.9. But the subject's in the very next verse of Hilchot Malachim 10.10 gives us a clue as to the subject of 10.9. And so let's let's see how what what would happen in the very next uh, law of ten ten if it was all if if that non Jew was translated there as Gentile. <coughs> so the first paragraph doesn't matter too much. We're going to focus on the second paragraph. Um, so we have the juxtaposition here and uh, the the juxtaposition over here. These the first paragraphs here aren't going to matter so much. It's really the second one that's really the focus. And Hilchot Malachim ten ten says we should not prevent a Gentile who desires to perform one of the Torah's mitzvot in order to receive reward from doing so, provided he performs it as required. If he brings an animal to be sacrificed as a burnt offering, we should receive it. Um, it's an important paragraph in Hilchot Malachim ten ten, but it's not our focus right now. This is our focus right here, Let, uh, uh, and we'll see. You'll see a logical juxtaposition within this paragraph that is logically invalid. Let's see if you guys can find it. If a Gentile gives charity, so we're talking about a non-Jew who gives charity here. We should accept it from him. Talking about the Jewish people should accept it. It appears to me that it should be given to the Jewish poor for the Gentile may derive his sustenance from the Jews and they are commanded to support him if necessary. In contrast, however, if a Gentile gives charity, and this is the key thing to focus on, we should accept it from him and give it to the Gentile poor. So you have a contradiction here. You have a Gentile giving charity down here and you also have a Gentile giving charity up here. 
yet they have two different outcomes. The Jews can keep keep the uh, tzedakah of this Gentile, yet this Gentile who gives charity, they don't keep the the tzedakah of him. They have the the charity. They have to give it to the Gentile poor. So. Gentile A gives charity, Gentile, Gentile B gives charity, yet two completely different outcomes. Obviously, that is uh, logically invalid, and it doesn't make sense. It can't make sense uh, from the English here. And that's how uh, the, the common way would be to translate um, these different types of non-Jews from their Hebrew into the English. And you can see here that through this juxtaposition, because it is so clear, because the text is so um, concise and has the same um, locale, that you can very much see that there's a problem here, that you cannot translate whatever is being translated from in the Hebrew, you can't tr translate it as Gentile. So what I did was I went to the Hebrew European, uh, the censored version uh, that I talked about, the, the medieval censored version, um, from the printing presses, and this is what 1010 looks like. So we should not prevent a Ben Noach who desires to perform. So it says Ben Noach in the Hebrew, and that's how I translated it. We should not prevent a Ben Noach who desires to perform one of the Torah's mitzvahs in order to receive reward from doing so, provided he performs it as required. If he brings an animal to be sacrificed as a burnt offering, we should receive it. Now let's focus on the key verse here, <clears throat> or the key, key paragraph of this verse. If a Ben Noach, and this is how I'm translating it, it says Ben Noach there. If a Ben Noach gives charity, we should accept it from him. It appears to me that it should be given to the Jewish poor, for the Ben Noach may derive his sustenance from the Jews as they are commanded to support him if necessary. In contrast, however, in contrast, if an Akum, and this is what it says in the European text in the Hebrew, it says an Akum. If an Akum gives charity, we should accept it from him and give it to the Akum poor. So you have an idolater that gives charity. You need to accept it from him, but then give it to the idolatrous poor. That makes a whole lot of sense. That makes a whole lot of sense, doesn't it? So now you see what's going on here. In the Hebrew, you have two types of non-Jews. You have a Ben Noach who, it seems to us from what we know, it seems it's, it's uh, I haven't, I have yet to prove it. I'll prove it in the, these later slides, but a Ben Noach is someone who keeps the seven mitzvahs, the seven laws of the children of Noah. And if he gives tzedakah to the Jews, the Jews can receive it and use it. They can, they can, they can keep it. However, if an Akum, a non-Jew who's an idolater gives charity, the non-Jews should accept it, but then give it to the idolatrous poor, the Akum poor. Now, a common, I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but a common response is that, well, wait a hold, hold on a second. The Akum is actually from censored text, so we don't know exactly what it is that they say. <clears throat> so I said, fine, let's actually use an uncensored manuscript. Uh, and there's uh, there's a few actually, and one of them is called the Kapach edition by Rabbi Kapach. He was a Yemenite uh, rabbi who obviously understood Hebrew, but also understood Aramaic, uh, Arabic, and could translate um, the Mishnah Torah from the Arabic manuscripts as well. And the fact that it was outside of e Christian Europe at the time, he. Uh, those texts, those manuscripts were around. Um, it doesn't involve the European censorships. So let's look and see what that says, this version of the Mishnah Torah. So let's juxtapose these two texts side by side. So we have our made up Gentile uh, text over here that would be <coughs> how most people would translate all the different types of non Jews as Gentile today. We have the Gentile that gives charity, the Jewish uh, poor can accept it from him, and then you have the Gentile who gives charity, um, the Jews can't accept it from him. Obviously the contradiction there. So over here we have the Ben Noach in, in the Kapach edition, it does say Ben Noach, it says that the Ben Noach gives tzedakah, the Jews can uh, uh, keep that tzedakah. And, but here's a new word. And you guys have heard this before in our uh, English vernacular, of course, but um, in the Hebrew it says, in contrast, if a goy gives charity, we should accept it from him and give it to the to the goy poor. Now, why is this in, in, interesting? Because goy here is is uh, used instead of akum. 
So in the uncensored text, it actually says goy here. So you have a connotation here that the goy in halakha here is the idol worshiper as well, which is interesting because our vernacular would say that a goy actually means all non-Jews. But we have a place here where in Jewish law, in Jewish law, it's actually referring to the idolater. And then in the non-Jewish non-idolater is referred to as a ben Noach. And this is uh, actually, when you get into the Hebrew, this is actually very commonplace. Um, and then not only is it commonplace, but it is the only place, uh, the, the only way that Goy has been translated as far as, as um, I've been studying. The Goy is actually referring to an uh, idolater. And the vernacular today of using the term goy is actually really bad because it's, it's muddling, it's muddying the waters between our vernacular and what actually Torah says about the goy. And so that's why you have problems in these translations about Bene Noach, where the authors of these books are bringing in texts uh, from the, the Torah about the goy and instead of calling them the idolater non-jew they're just saying gentile and it's confusing a lot of people and this is key it's key the gentiles getting confused with the idolater so let's look at this critical verse again from the three different texts you have the uncensored version the um kapak edition says a goy and these are the three the three words in uh Hebrew that you want to focus on here. These are the three different subjects. Everything else is the same. A goy sha'asek betorah haiv mita. The goy, a goy that involves himself in Torah, he's obligated to die. And then the European version says the akum that involves himself in Torah is obligated to die. So these are the two idolaters actually. The akum is explicitly the idolater. And then the goy, it seems like that's going to be the idolater as well, but we have yet to define it really. But let's, let's just for the sake of going through the slides, let's say that that is correct. And these two are the idol worshipers. And then, however, though, we did notice that there was a Ben Noach who, it, it, who doesn't appear to be the idolater. He's a good guy, it seems like. He's a guy who's able to give Sadak to the Jews and the Jews can keep it from him. However, in the seven... Uh, then the Sefer Shevin, uh, Seven Mitzvahs Hashem book by Rabbi Moshe Weiner, it doesn't say idolaters. It says the Ben Noach. A Ben Noach she'asak betoaz hav mita. A Ben Noach that involves himself in Torah is worthy of death. However, if we looked at the text of Hilko Malachim 1010, the Ben Noach is actually the good guy. He's not the Goy Akum. The bad guys, uh, the idol worshippers uh, that involve themselves in Torah story are worthy of death. Not the Ben Noach. Yet the halakha has been changed here um, instead of copy and pasted. The, the halakha has actually clearly been changed to say it ben noach and not the goy or the akum. This is a big problem because Torah is now changed uh, in the Sefer Sheva Mitzvah Hashem book in the Divine Code. It's translated as in, in the Divine Code as Gentile and it's a problem because it shouldn't say Gentile. It should have say idolater. So let's look at a excuse me, let's look at a little spreadsheet here just to clarify. In the Hebrew, we have a goy, transliterated as goy, obviously, and uh, that is the idolater. Then you have an akum, he's an idolater. But then you have the ben noach, who is a non-Jew as well, and all all three of these are non-Jews. But then you have a ben noach who keeps the seven. He is not an idolater by definition. So you can't (coughs) <coughs> you can't interchange these terms. You might be able to interchange the go and the Akum because they're both idolaters, but you definitely can't interchange the Ben Noach and the Akum or Goy because, you know, they're not synonymous. One of them is an idolater, the other is not. So this is, so, so you have the Gentile, non-Jew, Goy, Akum, Ben Noach. You have all these words. And in today's vernacular, they're synonymous. However, they should not be synonymous. This is critical. Those, all those terms should not be synonymous. All those terms have certain definitions, and we'll see, we'll see what those definitions are and why these cannot be interchangeable and why we should not be translating these as Gentile. And if you come across the book that says Gentile, you have to be very, very leery, very weir- leery of just what exactly is going on, and you need to actually get to the original source material of what it is they're talking about, unfortunately. 
In other words, a goy is worthy of death for involving in Torah beyond the seven. A ben noach, however, is not. It doesn't say anything about a ben noach in that aspect. Jews can keep the tzedakah, the charity of a ben noach. However, Jews cannot keep tzedakah from the akum goy because the akum goy is the idol worshiper. Therefore, the akum goy and the ben noach are critically different. This is a critical. This is this is a this is critical that you guys. This is the whole inion of my slides. The whole aspect of my slide is that the akum and the goy and the ben noach are different people, different types of people. <clears throat> One's an, idol, an idolater, one is not. And the word Gentile, therefore, is irrelevant today. And so why, what are, how are these words different? What, what, what um, are they exactly defined as? So let's go into the actual definitions. So what is a goy? The goy actually became known to be known with negative connotations. <clears throat> and it's actually someone who... Um, is involved in a nation that they all have the same tongue. Just like I mentioned earlier about the, uh, the, the Tower of Babel. During the Tower of Babel, when God messed uh, everybody's speech up, he put them into groups <clears throat> and gave an angel for each one of those groups. And they each had their own language and their own angel. And so Goyim were created after Babel. And they were given respective angels. And the, the term seems to have uh, devolved, actually, the goy. So it, it's a devolution of, a, of um, a term for groups of people. And it's said in the Talmud, in the Babylonian Talmud, in Bava Kama 38, it says that all the nations of the world reject the Torah. And that th this rejection... Um, part of this rejection was that they rejected, uh, they stopped doing the Sheva Mitzvot. They stopped doing the seven uh, commandments of the children of Noah. And that um, something to, to throw in here that is slightly different, but something you guys need to be aware of, is that the Ben Noach, B'nai Noach, and Goyim are under the category of what's called Umoto Alam, or the people of the world. And if you want to see a definition of why this is, you can see uh, the Rambam's Hilchot Malachim, uh, chapter 8, verse 11, <clears throat> the, the book of the Tanya in Chabad Hasidus. Uh, it shows that the that it's actually uh, defined by the negation of the Hasidei Motolam, the fact that um, these these people are not of the Hasidei Motolam, then that means that they are of the Umotolam, and they're also not of... Uh, and then you have the Mittler Rebbe who describes the Hasidei Motalam. And uh, then the Bava Kama 38, like I mentioned, talks about th that the peoples of the world don't even do the seven that they were commanded to do. And because the, the Hazal states that the peoples of the world don't even do what B'nai Noach are commanded to do, they are now actually under a different category where they were commanded to do, and now they don't do even. And so all the goyim rejected the Torah. You can read about this uh, in Bava Kama uh, on Mount Paran. They rejected the Torah, and it's said in Bava Kama there in 38 uh, that all the goyim uh, are commanded in the seven mitzvahs, but they don't actually do the seven mitzvahs. And it says, it says explicitly that the wealth, that because of this, that the wealth of the goyim are given to B'nai Israel. So the wealth of the goyim are given to the children of Israel. So I talked a little bit how goyim got created. It was the, through the 70 nations. After the fall of Babel, the uh, Hashem dispersed them into 70 nations. Um, Hashem, instead of giving Avraham an angel, Hashem actually took Avraham for his, himself. And so this actually created a space for non, uh, for for uh, the rest of the world to create, uh, to get deeper involved in Avodah to get deeper involved in idolatry, uh, because now the, uh, the proper tree, the proper way to go to Hashem would be to follow the path of Avraham, to merge with Avraham. And this is defined in the Ram Hall's work, Derech Hashem where anybody can graft themselves 
<clears throat> out of the tree of that they were placed in, uh, whatever nation that they were birthed in, and they can graft themselves into the into the tree of Avraham. So they can come under uh, they they can come out from under the yoke of whatever angel that they were born into, and graft themselves into the tree of Avraham. And even Avraham himself had the din or the judgment. Din is din and judgment are the same thing. Avraham had the din of a Ben Noach as well. And you can read about this in Lukate Sichot, so the Rebbe's writings, volume five, Vaishlach one. <coughs> so let's actually clarify, let's actually get into more explicit definitions of what a goy is. So how did the getter, the category for goy get created? And so in the Chazal and the Talmud, it's actually the um, goy, the word goy is actually codified as an idolater now. And so here in Talmud Bavli and Gittin 45b, it's, uh, it's a tractate that talks about whether non-Jews um, can write Torah scrolls and things like this, or, or if you can buy Torah scrolls from non-Jews. And it mentions here uh, explicitly about a goy. And Rabbi Eliezer, he says here that the plain, so stam is an important word here, that the plain unspecified intentions, so the stam intentions, the plain intentions of a goy, he says goy over here, is for, oh, the plain intentions of a goy is for a vodazara, is for idol worship. So this is the first time I've come across that in the Hazal, in the Talmud, in the Talmud, it explicitly states exactly how we are to treat what's called a goy, and you you treat him as if he is an idolater. So just the plain goy without any other intentions, you treat him as if he is an idolater, <clears throat> and this kind of runs its course through all of, <clears throat> excuse me, all of uh, Jewish law, and as you've seen in Hilchot Malachim and the like. And then Hilchot of Odazara by the Rambam. This carries the same connotation. And now, now we get a clearer understanding of why you don't save the life of this Akum, this Goy. It's because he, you have to consider him to be an idolater, unless specified otherwise. <clears throat> and now let's go to the Rambam, who's a, a Rishon. He, he came a lot later, about a thousand years after that writing of the Talmud. <clears throat> and he codified the Jewish law in uh, the Mishnah Torah, his magnum opus. And he says, he says, in all places, and this is the uncensored version, in all places that it said a plain goya, a goy stam, the plain goy. Stam means plain, goy. In all places that it said a plain goy without any other adjectives, just a simple goy. This is the servant of strange worship, an idolater. So whenever you come across the, the word goy here, um, in Jewish law, what the Rambam is saying is whenever you come across that term, that's referring to the idol worshiper. Now it becomes a lot clearer in the Rambam's works that whenever he talks about a ben noach and juxtaposed with a goy, now you can understand how these two different non-Jews are viewed. The Ben Noach is probably the non-idolater, and then the Goy is, from the definition here, the actual idolater. In commentary, there's a there's a, a Rishona commentary on um, a Talmud tractate called Makos 9a by the Ritva. And the Ritva actually breaks down all the different major categories of non-Jews, and this is critical too. And even the Ritva here says, a stam goy. <clears throat> so there's the word stam again, a plain goy. Um, he is not cautious. A plain goy is not cautious in keeping the seven mitzvahs. So a plain goy is not cautious in keeping the seven mitzvahs b'nai Noach, the seven commandments of the children of Noah. That's what the Ritva says on Makos 9a. See the word goy here, see the word stam. <clears throat> he is one that is not cautious to practice or keep the seven. Now, a common counter argument that, that you're going to come across is, is uh, somebody would say, well, goy refers to Israel as well. That is not true. 
Um, if you if you remember, I said that a key term is stom. It's an adjective, stom goy. It's a plain goy. However, when Israel is referred to as a goy, they're not referred to as a plain goy or stom goy. They're referred to as as a, uh, with adjectives such as goy kadosh, a holy nation. Things like this. They are not assumed. The reason why that has to be explicit is because a goy without any other adjective associated with it is considered to be a um, idol worshiping nation, an idol worshiper. So a goy kadosh is not the same as a stom goy, a plain goy like the Rambam and others defined. If you if you remember, we had three different rabbis, big rabbis, saying that there is the stom goy is the idol worshiper. So there are adjectives that distinguish from the Stam Goy, such as the Goy Kadosh. But we're, re- ta- we're referring to the Stam Goy, just the plain Goy. <clears throat> According to what is said in the Gemara, this law applies only to the nations which are not restricted by ways of religions and customs. As the Gemara said of them, God saw that B'nai Noach were not fulfilling the seven mitzvahs, uh, the seven commandments that accepted upon themselves. So he permitted their property to the Jews. So here you have um, you have non-Jews that were B'nai Noach, but they're not keeping the seven. So Goyim are B'nai Noach, however, but the fact that they're not keeping the seven of B'nai Noach, they're put under a different category called Goy. And not only that, but he permitted their property to the Jews. So the Jews could make better use of doing godly things with their wealth instead of ungodly things. As long as they are obliged by these commandments. Therefore, these, those B'nai Noach who fulfill the seven commandments should be treated by us, by the Jews, as we are treated by them. And we should not favor ourselves in judgment. In, order, in other words, there are B'nai Noach who do still keep the laws of the children of Noah, the seven commandments. And you should be kind to them. You should do good things to them and not be harsh with them and things like that. That's what this commentary is saying. Now it is unnecessary to specify that this is also the case concerning the nations that are under duress, that are restricted by ways of religions and customs. Beit HaBahira and Bavakama 37b. So in other words, he's what he's saying is that there are not really that many goyim today. The non-Jews that are that are exist today, even if they don't keep the seven, are actually under duress. There and a person that's under duress that are anusim are not liable for the things that they do because they are not fully responsible. They can't be fully responsible. They're under duress for some way. And and uh, the commenter says here it's by ways of religions and customs. In other words, it's by um, it's just the way their society works. It's not that they actually really want to do a Vodazara or actually know what a Vodazara is. It's just something that they were taught by their parents and the like. So what does the Ritva say? I, I mentioned that the Ritva mentions the three different Gadarim, the three different types of non-Jews. So we mentioned the Goy. What does he say about a Ben Noach? <clears throat> he says a Ben Noach is one. A Ben Noach here, you see it in the quotes. A Ben Noach is someone who is not who is not received by a base a, a base den of Israel. And uh, however, however he he does um, perform on upon himself. Uh, he's but he's just not one who is he's just he's just not one who is commanded yet he does. In other words. He's he's uh, not accepted by the base din. He's a Ben Noach who's not accepted by the base din. Um, he does he does do the seven mitzvahs, but he doesn't do them because he's commanded to do them. He's not commanded, and he does. In other words, the base din doesn't command him to do it. He just does the seven. And the Jewish people don't have a mitzvah l'kihu so to sustain this uh this uh ben noach here this stam ben noach i should say this plain ben noach um <clears throat> however in today's in today's uh world because our laws basically do keep the seven uh, we can assume that this ben noach can be taken care of though however and uh that's a that's a little rabbit trail that i don't want to go down to right now but um, basically non-jews today uh, can be taken care of. And if you want to know more, you can read Rav Aaron Soloveitchik's work in Od Yisrael, Yosef, Benichai, uh, Simon, 
seven on um, on why that why that is. So the Ritva here is saying that a Ben Noach is keeping his seven, but he just hasn't went before a Jewish base then, and he's not received as someone who has accept, accepted the seven uh, through the Torah, yet he does the seven on his own. So he's not a goy, basically. He, he does do the seven, <clears throat> whereas the goy does not do the seven. There's a third type of non-Jew, a main type of non-Jew, I should say, and he's called the Ger Toshav. Ger Toshav means like a resident sojourner. Um, somebody who resides in the land of Israel among the Jewish people, and he's striving to know Hashem. So a Ger Toshav, what is he? The Ritva says that in order to understand the issues that the Gomorrah uh, says here, we got to proceed with the words of the Ritva from Mesechet, from, uh, from a tractate in the Talmud called Makos 9a, which is what we're talking about here, Makos 9a. And it said that there are three different ways to say, uh, to talk about Goyim, to talk about non-Jews. It's funny, he actually says Goyim here. But he actually breaks down those three goyim into three different categories, where one of them actually is goy, which we talked about earlier. So here you can see that even in the uh, times of the Rishonim, that it looks like they use the vernacular term goyim, but it needs to be clarified, which is the whole purpose of you know why he's writing this, is because there seems to be some kind of misunderstanding of different types of non-Jews, and so he has to write this in order to clarify exactly what's going on. So he says there's three different categories. You have the Ger Toshav, you have a Ben Noach, and then you have a Goy. So a Ger Toshav is one that uh, accepts, is accepted by a base then of Israel, and he uh, performs the seven mitzvahs of the children of Noah that were commanded to the children of Noah. Uh, and he's uh, accepted by the base then and called, he's called as one who's uh, that's in his that are that's commanded and does in his seven mitzvahs. He's one that is not that is commanded and does. So the Ben Noach is someone who is not commanded and does, but this Geratoshav is commanded and does. And the Jewish people do have a mitzvah lichichu, so uh, do have a, a commandment to sustain his life in case. Um, for instance, let's say he comes on hard times or he's uh, he got hurt or something like that. The Jewish community does have an obligation to help him. Um, <clears throat> and because, the as uh, Rabbi Soloveitchik would say today, uh, because uh, our Western culture basically does keep the seven, um, and it is illegal uh, to do many of the things to break the seven, it, there, this mitzvah luchi huso actually is in effect a little bit today. Not fully in effect. Uh, there's no ger toshav gamor. There's no complete ger toshav today because there's no yovel. However, to some extent there is. And to, to that same extent should be the same extent that the Jewish people help these types of non-Jews. And so today you have many non-Jews who do uh, study the Torah uh, and do the seven mitzvahs for the sake of Hashem and do the seven mitzvahs because the Torah says so. And these types of people are like this Geratoshav here that's talked about. And the, the um, Rabbi Soloveitchik and I, you know, would argue that th those types of non-Jews today are like a Geratoshav and they should be helped um, and be a part of the Jewish community to, to this extent. <clears throat> as much as possible, even though there is no Yovel, even, even though there are not the Ger Toshav Gamor, they're not the complete Ger Toshav. And that's how most, <clears throat> that's how most uh, non-Jews that are affiliated uh, with Judaism, that's how, that's, this is the proper procedure and how they should interact with the Jewish community. Um, a lot of people that refer to themselves as Noahides that study the Torah are probably under this getter, this kind of getter of this Ger Toshav or this Kager Toshav, somebody who is like a Ger Toshav. And this is actually the proper category for um, non-Jews today that 
that uh, believe in the Torah and do things for the sake of Hashem and keep the seven mitzvahs at the least. <clears throat> and what's also interesting is that the Ger Toshav is no longer under the Ger or the category of the Umot HaAlam. You are from the Rambam and other places specifically mentions that this type of Ger Toshav is, is uh, from the Hasidic Umot HaAlam. They are from the pious people of the world. And so you have the you have people that do good in the world. They don't um, follow the Torah, but they do good in the world, not for their own sake, but for the sake of uh, Hashem and for the sake of their fellow man. They are called Hasidim Otalam. They're the pious peoples of the world. These are the people that hid uh, Jews in the Holocaust and things like this, even though that, that non-Jew might have been an idol worship, like a, a priest or something like that, even though he might have been involved in idolatry. The fact that he um, did good works for not his own sake, but for the sake of his fellow and for the sake of the Jewish people, um, he's considered Hasidic Motalam. But once that person uh, becomes attached to Torah and starts to keep the seven mitzvahs and comes out of idolatry, uh, they are like this Ger Toshav, and they are no longer part of the people of the world, but are now attached with Israel attached to Torah and attached to Hashem. And this could be found in, uh, this is talked about in Likutei Sichot by the Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, Likutei Sichot, volume 31, Parshas Mishpatim, footnote 56. And this has extreme, this is very good implications uh, for these types of people. They have a share in the world to come. <coughs> so let's let's talk more about this these types of Gerim. These these types of non-Jews that attach to uh, Israel, that attach to Hashem, and attach to Torah, and this this is uh, the what I would say is the proper definition for most of what would be called the Noahides today. Noahides today are definitely not Goyim Akum. Um, they could be Bnei Noach, I don't know, but. Um, they could also be what is called the ger here. And uh, I'm going to talk about what's called the nilva ger. Nilva means attachment or attach, attaching. So a ger that attaches, what is he attaching to? The Ramban in his commentary on Devarim 33.4 says, our sages of blessed memory expounded that this verse in the verse in, from 33.4, uh, that the scripture does not say the heritage of the house of Yaakov. The, so it's talking about who gets the Torah. The, the Torah is a heritage of who? And it says the, her, the Torah is a heritage of, of um, the congregation of Yaakov. So Rambam says that, uh, what's going on here? He, Rambam wants to know. The scripture doesn't say that it's the heritage of the house of Yaakov or of the seed of Yaakov, but rather it says the congregation, the kahal. And what does this allude to? He says this alludes to to um, that the multitudes will congregate to join, and that the Torah will forever be a heritage of Yaakov and all those who will join them. And so in Hebrew it says here um, they are the gerim, they are the uh, gerim that attach to Hashem to serve Him. So um, it says Garim here. Now this is, uh, it says converts here. That's also a bad translation. We can get to convert another time. That would require a whole set of slides. Convert is another bad term, similar to Gentile. That should not be translated. It should be transliterated. In other words, they should, be, they should just say Garim here. So you have Garim that attached to Hashem. So we just talked about the Ger Toshav. You could also be this type of Ger, though, that attaches to Hashem. If you attach to Hashem, your heritage is, is uh, the Torah, and you are part of the this congregation of Jacob. This is huge. Okay? You have to know this and constantly refer to this the commentary on the Ramban. So if you are a non-Jew who does the things that I spoke about. You keep the seven and you do them for the sake of Torah because the Torah says so and you attach to Hashem. You are this type of person. You're part of the congregation of Jacob and you're this Nilva Ger. So 
<clears throat> we'll start to wrap things up. Let's go into another definition. Who are the Umoto Alam that I mentioned? The Umoto Alam, the people of the world, are described as being selfish, actually. They do not receive a portion in the world to come. They are idolaters. Uh, they're described in the Tanya in Lukute Amarim, chapter 1. They are a subset of humanity. They're not all of humanity. They're a subset of humanity. And they are part of... Uh, they are the actual superset for the plain Ben Noach. So, so Ben Noach that they might keep the seven, but they don't do things for the sake of Hashem. They do things for some kind of ulterior motive, even if they might seem like good good motives. Anything that is not for the sake of Hashem is uh, considered to be selfish. And this is described in Hilchot in the, the Rambam's Hilchot Malachim, chapter eight, eleven. <clears throat> this is also a superset for Goyim as mentioned in Bava Kama 38. So these are all the peoples of the world. You have the Goyim, you have these Stam B'nai Noach, just these plain B'nai Noach that don't want to attach to Hashem. In the end times, though, however, the Goyim aren't going to be considered idolaters uh, in, in judgment. Um, the Goyim will actually eventually become Gerim and involve themselves in Torah study. So they're actually going to want to know. It doesn't mean that they are going to get to know Hashem, but they're going to strive to. They're going to try to. And this is described in Hilchot Malachim chapter 12. And the Ramhal defined, or the Ramhal talks about this, that there will be no more Goyim or nations. In other words, there will be no more um, the, the, the 70 nations that were given to the 70, excuse me, the 70 angels that were given to the 70 nations will loose their control of the nations and the nations will flock to Israel and there will be no more goyim as we know it. There will still be the same people from those goyim. However, they will not be under the, the powers of those angels and their languages anymore. They will come to Israel, they will be of one speech or will be learning one speech and they will be involving themselves in the study of Torah for the sake of actually knowing the, 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 um, the knowledge of Hashem. So we just talked about the Umot Olam. Let's talk about the Hasidic Umot Olam or the pious peoples of the world. The pious peoples of the world, even though they might still be in idolatry, even though they might still be um, uh, going to like church and things like this, they are, the, if they are part of the Hasidim Otalam, they are considered selfless people. Um, and you might, you might wonder, like, well, how in the world can they go to church? How in the world can they do those things and be uh, selfless and being uh, pious peoples of the world and be doing things for the sake of Hashem? <clears throat> and the key is, is because they are involved in what's called shituf. They don't know any better, in other words. They are under duress. They were, they were raised in the church or whatever um, religion that they were raised up in, and they weren't giving, given any other options. And shituf is permitted to these people because they don't know any better. Um, however, it is up to us and up to the Jewish people to free those people from the ignorance that they were raised in, basically. And you do that through teaching them about the Sheva Mitzvah Spene Noach, about the seven laws of the children of Noah, and uh, trying to encourage them to embrace those seven uh, because the Torah says so and because uh, Hashem says so through his Torah. These people, these Hasidim Oto Alam, uh, they do receive a portion in the world to come. Even though they are involved in this idolatry, it's because they are, uh, they are anusim. They are, um, um, they are under duress. And a person who's under duress does not, a person who is under duress is not uh, accountable for their actions, for, their, for whatever uh, harm they may do. And so this is described <clears throat> by the Mittler Rebbe in, in Ner HaMitzvahs in the uh, Sederim Dach, uh, talking about the Chassidim Alam, and even though they're still in Avodah Zarah, and they might not fully be keeping the seven mitzvahs, they are under duress from the, what's called the Avodah Zarah, the other side, the, the bad side of their father's family, society, etc. And so... <clears throat> What the seven mitzvahs does and what the Torah does, what King David does, things like this, the Mashiach will do is that uh, they will release the bonds, the uh, 
they will release the duress of these people that are that are uh, in Avodazara and the Sitra Ahra. And this is a subset of humanity. Not everybody are like this. However, there are kind people that we've all met that are Hasidim Ta'alam. And these are people that are under duress and they need help. Why are they called Hasidim Umo Ta'alam? It's because they are a subset within Umo Ta'alam. They are still in the peoples of the world. They are not yet attached to Israel. They are not yet attached to Torah. Um... <clears throat> However, they do, they do because they are Hasidim Watalam, they do have, they do detect an essence of God, godliness. They do detect Hashem in the world, and uh, they try their best to follow that. And so, <clears throat> so the types of non-Jews that I referred to earlier as the Ger Toshav, the Ger Toshav are from these Hasidim Watalam. The Ger Toshav are from these types of people. So a person that is Hasidim Watalam, who learns about the seven mitzvahs and is growing towards Hashem, they become the Sker Toshav, and they are no longer fr uh, from the Umot Alam. They are no longer involved in the Klippa. <clears throat> I shouldn't say no longer, but they're, they're trying to get out of the Klippa or whatever, where, wherever they are in their spirituality um, in that aspect. They are coming out of the uh, Umot Alam, the Hasidi Umot Alam, and they uh, receive a portion of the world to come. So you have two, you have two, um, what you would think uh, are two uh, groups of people. You have your Stam B'nai Noach, just your plain B'nai Noach. Even though they might keep the seven, they don't do things for the sake of Hashem or the sake of Torah. And they don't have a Chelek Be'olam Haba. They don't have a portion in the world to come. <clears throat> However, you do have B'nai Yisrael, and they do have a Chelek, a portion in the world to come, because they are attached to to Hashem and attached to his Torah. And these are two mutually exclusive things. However, as we talked about, there are, there are different types of people that are not represented on this chart, this di these diagrams. So let's look at one that is a little bit more in detail. <clears throat> so these are, <clears throat> these are the present organization of uh, uh, the animal souls. And this last one was for the godly souls. And the reason why I made this is that Hasidi Amot Ha'alam, they're getting in touch, in the Ger Toshav, they're getting in touch with the, their godly souls. And they are in this category here. <clears throat> they are coming out of, maybe they never even were in, but they are coming out of this category here. And every, everyone, however, has what's called an animal soul. And there are two basic uh, types of animal souls. There's an animal soul that is completely um, sheltered from godliness uh, from their perspective. And then there's another uh, group that um, <clears throat> are not fully involved in Kalipa, uh, are not fully involved in um, an opaque view of Hashem. They, they do see an element of godliness in the world. So you have a, a group of people that see no godliness in the world from their perspective, and then you see a second people that do. And the, this, this first uh, group is uh, where you have the uh, complete idolaters. You have the Akram, the Nokri, the Goy. <clears throat> we didn't mention Nokri, but Nokri is, an, is a Hebrew word that means an, own, an, an, an unknown person. And an unknown person should be uh, judged as a, being a Goy or an Akum by default back in the day. Today, an unknown person, you, you actually assume that, they're, uh, that they do keep the seven, as Rabbi uh, Aaron Soloveitchik talks about, as I mentioned earlier. So this type of person, this type of animal soul is a selfish soul. They um, are called the Umotalam, the peoples of the world. They emanate from what's called the three impure shells or the three Im impure klipot, shalosh klipot ha ha hatameos. And <clears throat> they fully emanate from the Sitra Ahara, the other side. This is also where like non-kosher animals emanate from. And these people have no portion in the world to come. Um, and it might be interesting that I put B'nai Noach here. 
Why do I put B'nai Noach here? Is because, as uh, the Rambam mentions, there are certain B'nai Noach that don't keep the seven because uh, the Torah says so. Even though they, they've been exposed to Torah, they don't. They deny it. They just want to keep the seven, and they don't have any kind of <clears throat> connection with Hashem and Torah. Even though they keep the seven, even though they keep the seven, that is still a certain um, disconnect with Hashem and Torah, and therefore they don't receive a portion in the world to come. They are only living for this world. And because they're only living for this world, their soul will also die with, uh, with this world when, they're, when their body dies. Because they don't have a connection with anything greater. So it's actually very logical. However, there are people that are, even though they might, this is actually kind of funny, it sounds contradictory, but even though there are certain types of people that even though they are involved physically in idolatry, um, the fact that they weren't given the options to not be in idolatry, and uh, they don't have a clear perspective of Torah because they weren't taught Torah, etc., those people do have a share in the world to come. And it's because they are selfless. They are... Uh, they are they care about their fellow man and they care about Hashem even though they do something what's called shituf shituf means like an intermediary they 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 have descriptions and names of Hashem that are not true names of Hashem and um, they uh, yet that is how they relate to Hashem in other words they have a connection with Hashem uh, that's higher than their consciousness but their consciousness their intellect cannot uh, fully explain what it is that they are connected to, and um, therefore they're still involved in idolatry on the physical level. Um, however, these people, because they're selfless, they do things for the sake of Hashem that they're attached to, um, they do receive a portion in the world to come, and they emanate from what's called the illuminated shell, or what's called Klippas Noiga. So you had the three impure Klippas, but then you have a fourth Klippa called the Klippas Noiga. And it's actually a shell, even though it is a shell, it's still Klippa, but it lets some light through. It lets some godly light through that this person can see and interact with. <clears throat> and this person at can attach to that, that, that light. This is the same... Um, Klippa, this Klippa Snoiga is where all kosher animals uh, emanate from. And just like a kosher animal can be used for good things and bad things, so too a human being that uh, emanates from this Klippa Snoiga can use, um, use themselves for good or bad things. And they're aware of that to some extent. Um, this is why many people feel obligated to do mitzvahs, even though they don't feel they're commanded in the mitzvahs as a Jewish person. They, are still, they still feel obligated to do the right thing. Um, and so you have the Hasidim Oto Alam, then you have people that, that are attached to actual Torah, physically, uh, they study Torah, and these are the Gerim, these are the Nilva Gerim and, and B'nai Yisrael. So why is this pure speech important? <clears throat> As I shown the problem texts that were translated from the Goy and the Akum, um, this is important because there are a lot of anti-Semites. There are a lot of anti-Jewish people that love to quote these kinds of texts out of context. And because they're quoted out of context, and they because they don't really know the texts themselves, the, these anti-Semites and these anti-Jews are not fully accountable for what they're doing. Um, so who is actually accountable? The problem is the, the real accountability, unfortunately, rely on the Jews that perpetuate these notions of Gentiles. Um, and all these halakhic uh, laws that that um, are tran that are translated as Gentile. Uh, however, in the Hebrew, uh, as I've shown, there are many different types of non-Jews. And so, through improper translations, and when a person teaches that all non-Jews are Gentiles, uh, and you quote the Jewish laws and you call everybody Gentile when in our vernacular Gentile means all non-Jews today, um, these people don't really know what Klal Yisrael is and the congregation of Yaakov really is. And this is a problem. Um, Non-Jews today in most Jewish shuls and, con and synagogues congregations have the den of Akum. This is actually a problem. Uh, 
<clears throat> the, the, the proper din of non-Jews today, because the nations of the world actually more or less keep the seven, should be more aligned with the Ger Toshav, not the idol worshiper or the Akum. Um, for, for example, it's forbidden to save the uh, Gentile's life, uh, Goy's life, if he's choking during Shabbos. So for instance, heaven forbid a non-Jew was to go into a shul today, uh, and he starts to choke on Shabbos. Uh, a Jewish person, if he believes that that non-Jew has the din or the judgment of an idol worshiper, as we've said, as we've shown, he doesn't. He's not obligated to save his life. <clears throat> However, um, if you go by the dictum that all non-Jews today are not idol worshippers, you are. You do have an obligation to save his life, and that's that's a topic for another discussion. But this is the this is um, where. Uh, these translations of Gentile lead us to these kinds of conclusions and it's really bad and we need to get back to proper translations and um, and if you don't know how to properly translate something transliterate it say instead of saying um, idol worshiper say goy or say akum at least people will be able to look up in the references what it is that you're actually referring to and one of the big Iker terms is lo ma'alin velo meridin, that you should not lift up and you should not lower um, an idol worshiper down. However, somebody who's a ger toshav, somebody is a non-Jew who keeps the seven and does them for Torah, the sake of Torah, um, or if even if he's not doing it for the sake of Torah, but he's under duress, he's like an idol worshiper today. Um, the fact that he's not uh, a true idol worshiper, but the fact that he's under duress means that you are obligated to uplift him in his time of need because he is under duress. And even more so for somebody who's not under duress, under duress and does accept the Torah and does keep the seven. <clears throat> so I, I appreciate you guys for listening to what I have to say. And this is a highly important topic. So please don't ever use the term Gentile. Or, and if you do, at least clarify um, and be very weary whenever you, uh, leery, excuse me, when you come across the term Gentile in English translations of Hebrew works. This is critical, um, and it's critical for, for the redemption of the world. Thank you.